So I was watching the X Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. The views, opinions, and conclusions expressed in the following program are those of the host, guests, and or callers, and not those of Relmar McConnell Media Company, our corporate divisions or entities, the Exxon Broadcast Network, Simul Radio, Simul TV, our staff, management, advertisers, broadcast affiliates, and affiliated broadcast networks. Welcome back to another episode of Cal's Corner Radio Show online here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf and I'm your host and the executive producer of the show is the one and only Rob McConnell. Welcome back, folks, to the first episode we've done after a few weeks. We took a break uh, just before and, of course, over Thanksgiving holiday. And it was fun for me personally having a Thanksgiving, first time I'd had one in many years, That was good. Being an American overseas, living outside the United States, I don't always get a chance for Thanksgiving. In fact, I want to share with you real quickly what it was like the first time in the year 2000 I tried to have Thanksgiving when I just moved to Europe, and I'll tell you what happened. Basically, I was really happy in a city like Prague to find a store that had American-sized turkeys because, you know, I like a big turkey and, of course, it to last several days after the Thanksgiving Day feasts. And what I wanted to do was, you know, carve it up for my friends and family and things like that. And here we are. I buy the turkey. I'm happy with the size and weight of it. The price was fantastic. It's frozen. Found a fantastic meat shop in the diplomatic area of Prague, in the Davitska area in Prague 6. That's where I lived at the time. So I take it home, and it turns out that uh, it won't fit in the oven. It turns out that the turkey is too big for the communist-era ovens that Stalin made that my flat was equipped with. So now I had to take this turkey and cut it in half. And after cutting it in half, I could put it in sideways and it fit in half of it. And, of course, it was frozen, so, of course, it was very hard to cut. So I had to thaw it first, then to cut it in half. Then I could only bake one half at a time. And that, of course, just completely destroyed the Thanksgiving. It was still delicious, but... uh, Uh, Thank God I've only had one Thanksgiving like that. This time it wasn't like that at all, Uh, only this time I didn't overeat. So I've been losing a lot of weight lately the natural way, so happy to do that. Anyway, I'm glad everybody had a Thanksgiving, or good Thanksgiving. Anyway, this week people are mourning the death of President George H.W. Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, who is the father, of course, of President George W. Bush. And it's interesting to see the reaction by the politicians across the spectrum to Bush's death, as well as the general media, who they didn't always like him, let's be honest. And then, of course, the reaction from young people today, most of whom that I've spoken to don't even know who he was. And I find that to be inexcusable, even if you don't like history. And most people I know, unfortunately, don't like history. I don't understand that. I love history. I don't understand why people are not interested in knowing what has happened in the past. It makes no sense to me, but apparently most people aren't interested in history. And even most people in Europe today and most Americans, young people. Now, again, this is young people, these brilliant millennials we keep talking about that make the headlines for often the wrong reasons today. Most of them don't even know what the Holocaust was. Try asking them. And then if they've heard of it, ask them to spell the word properly, capital H, you know, a little detail like that. Why is it capital? And then tell them, ask them to describe what it was about. Let's see what their answers are. You'll find it quite tragic, actually. 
So here we have President Bush, who has now died. And let's be honest, <clears throat> it was kind of predictable that he probably would pass away this year because we must remember that his wife Barbara had died months earlier. They were married for over 70 years. And it is a statistical fact that when people are married for such long periods of time and one passes away, the other tends to die within six months of the other roughly or certainly within a year. The exception seems to be women who tend to outlive men by a number of years for mostly biological reasons, uh, health issues aside. But other than that, it was predictable that he would pass. But let's be honest, if you live to be in your 90s at all, let alone in your mid-90s, that's a good life. Most of us and most people listening to this broadcast will probably, based on statistics, never live to be in their 90s. In fact, for the second year in a row now in the United States, the life expectancy rate has now dropped, and that, of course, is due to bad lifestyles, and it's getting worse. In fact, a recent study a few days ago showed that only about 12% of today's populace in the United States is of the right fitness level, cardiovascular-wise, that science says we have to be to have healthy, long lives, and that's just not happening with today's lifestyle, especially people who love to sit on their smartphones all day. You know, real quickly, speaking about that before we go back to the issue of Bush, one of the new features I like on my smartphone is it gives me a weekly report. It pushes it in my face. I have to clear it from my screen, otherwise it won't let me do my business on my phone. And it tells me how much screen time that I spend every week. And I'm surprised at how much time I spend, even though I try to spend as little as possible, even though I go in these spurts of posting things and I don't for a while, then I post things and I don't for a while. There's no pattern, just depends on what's going on. But even I'm surprised to see that, you know, I'm spending over two hours a week online on my phone, on social media and doing whatever. And that's independent of this show, which is a different animal entirely. And of course, I don't mind doing this show. And of course, you have to talk and be online to do it. That's the point of the show. Whereas Facebook and stuff, it's not necessary to respond to everything. And you'll notice that I'm not the kind of person that likes to do selfies and says, here I am at a shopping mall or standing in the statue of, front of Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Believe me, having been in 27 countries over the years, I could have done infinite numbers of selfies and had a huge Instagram account, but just not really into that. In fact, a lot of the reason I'm even online is because a late friend of mine had set that up for me and told, told me I really need to do it. He was right. Couldn't argue with him. So here I am. Take it or leave it. Anyway, getting back to something much more important, President Bush, the thing that really strikes me in contrast about his death is, of course, Ronald Reagan was the last president who died before Bush. And the media today, especially the la-la left-wing liberal media, was really shocked if you go back and look at the stuff that they said at the time when Reagan died. They were shocked over the tremendous outpouring of emotions that the American people had for Reagan when he died. We weren't supposed to be that kind of a country. Well, it turns out we were. We were even more so than the media ever gave Reagan any credit for. So we owe a historic thank you or a legacy, if you will, to both Ronald Reagan and, of course, his successor, George Bush, because both those men made a point to do something that most people today just don't think about. They're not grateful for. They don't think it concerns them, and they're, they couldn't be more wrong about this issue than humanly possible. They're completely wrong. They're not grateful, or they don't even think about the fact that Reagan and Bush ended the Cold War. They don't think about where the world would be today if the Cold War was still raging. Well, if the Cold War was still going on, the odds are the world wouldn't be here today. It would have destroyed itself. We would have destroyed ourselves, the human race, in a nuclear holocaust. That's most likely what would have happened and certainly was on the way to happening on more than one occasion in the times where the former USSR, Soviet Union, but it has with the United States and the NATO alliance. And those hostile feelings are still there. You know, Russia, the Cold War is officially over, but Russia is still an armed and dangerous nuclear power. Just ask people in Ukraine, they can tell you about the Russians. And of course, we have nuclear weapons as well. And nuclear weapons remain a threat when used or misused by rogue nations, such as North Korea, trying to disarm that country. But amazingly, Bush and Reagan ended the Cold War, and especially the transition period of the post-Cold War period, a very fragile period of time, 
where what happened is all of these thousands of nuclear weapons that were scattered across Central and Eastern Europe, they had to be rounded up, safely secured, disarmed, that material uh, then put into safe storage or safely reused elsewhere like in nuclear reactors or for medicine purposes. There is a branch of science that is called nuclear medicine. It's a very fascinating area of medicine, in fact. So all this had to be done, and these weapons had to be kept out of the hands of the mafia, the Russian mafia, criminal elements, and other intelligence agencies and even countries such as the governments in Iran who wanted, of course, to buy nuclear weapons and have tried to buy them on the black market for years. Now, all this had to be managed, and it wasn't cheap. It was a huge effort that required complete cooperation and transparency and accountability between the former Soviet Union, their entire military command and control structures, and, of course, the experts in the United States and Europe. And, yes, that included Canadians as well, let's be honest, and give them their credit. They worked with the United States much more in many areas than the Europeans did. In fact, the Europeans kind of sat along and went along for the ride and felt kind of happy to be there. In fact, they paid Russia extra money, billions of dollars, $10 billion, to leave uh, Germany early. <laughs> they were in a hurry to get this done. They wanted the Americans and the Canadians to sort out the details, you know, just like <laughs> Europeans tend to do, you know, punt the uh, core of the problem down the road, let someone else deal with it, and they can, you know, deal with the periphery. And that's exactly what happened. So Bush, when he was president, managed this. And I remember when I was working at Lawrence Livermore Lab, there was a controversy over Bush. Because people criticized him for being lame on foreign policy. I'll never forget the time that they were criticizing him specifically for stalling for time, quote unquote, or trying to stall for some reason they couldn't pin it down as to why he wasn't signing some treaties that had been effectively nailed down and agreed to between Reagan and Gorbachev. And of course, as Reagan's successor, he was going to sign these. And he was expected to do it. He indicated no problem uh, after he succeeded Reagan, but yet the work still wasn't done. So what was Bush's problem? Well, it had to deal with something the CIA knew, and Bush being the former director of the CIA knew, that the Russians didn't know that we knew, meaning the U.S. government. And it was because of that rare piece of intelligence, which I'll share with you after the commercial break here, that Bush deliberately stalled Gorbachev out for 18 months total in the first part of his new administration so that he would achieve a nuclear arms reduction treaty that has never been beaten since. That has been the best deal ever since. And I'll share you those secret details after the commercial break here. We'll be right back. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomenon, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit 
www.exoneradiotv.com or www.exonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. The new non-fiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades, there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. Welcome back to another segment here, segment number two, actually, on Cal's Corner Radio Show online here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host, and the executive producer of the show is Rob McConnell. And we're talking about the uh, death of President George H.W. Bush here, and I promised to share with you some details which used to be classified. Now they're public, but they're not known by most of the people. So hopefully uh, most of you listening to this will be hearing this for the first time. I remember very vividly when I was doing work with the U.S. government and there were criticisms of Bush and Reagan dragging their feet, quote unquote, uh, dealing with the Russians. And I remember there was a period in which the um, first year or so of George Bush's administration, you can actually go back through the internet and scour and find headlines. Go back the first year, year and a half especially, and you'll see that Bush is being criticized for dragging his feet in trying to tie up various agreements with the Russians. And of course, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia was in a frantic panic mode because it had collapsed economically and socially and politically, of course, and militarily, and had to rebuild itself while also protecting its vast arsenal of deadly weapons, which included chemical and biological weapons as well, and countless numbers of cities and uh, towns which officially did not exist and were officially not acknowledged on any maps, the locations and disclosure of those bases and facilities, if you will, which were all secret, even in Russian society. They didn't appear on any maps at all. Uh, Again, uh, these all had to be dealt with and cleaned up and handled responsibly as part of winding down from the Cold War. And I'll never forget uh, what happened at that time. I remember years later when I moved to Europe, I was actually going to Poland and I actually visited two cities that officially did not exist. They were cities which were later revealed after the fall of the Soviet Union. That's when I got to go there as a journalist. But originally these were cities that were built by the Nazis in Germany, in, uh, by the Nazis from Germany in World War II. They were built in neighboring Poland after Poland had been conquered by the Nazis. And these were uh, secret facilities that Hitler's uh, Wehrmacht had been using for uh, building and servicing large uh, divisions of panzer tanks. This is These were two main facilities where the armor would be pouring out into the east and central parts of Europe for his invasion plans, which would later include Russia. Well, when the Russians took over that part of Poland, they went ahead and took these cities, changed their names, and then officially wiped them off the map. There was no record of them. And I actually have in my files uh, maps that show the area before and after these cities were put back on the maps. And, of course, I went to these locations in person 
witnessed the stuff myself, took images, etc., sent them to a Fox producer, a uh, well-known Fox producer, Bob Kiviat, years ago. And uh, it reminded me back of the criticisms of what had been going on over Bush. And the criticism was, again, that he was dragging his feet, when in reality the CIA had some intelligence against the Russians or on the Russians, which told Bush that he should take his sweet time and not be in a hurry to wrap up certain arms negotiations treaties with them because the Russians' position was actually a lot more desperate than they were leading or misleading the U.S. to believe. Specifically, the CIA's analysts had determined, and this is the secret within the secret that most people don't know, that about a third, at least 20 percent more of Russia's missiles that were sitting in their under-serviced silos in the ground, exposed to the elements, they said about 20 more percent, maybe as high as a third of them, that was an optimistic estimate, but at least 20 percent of them, if they waited another year or so, would be rusted over. Essentially useless, non-serviceable, and they're there in number to be counted, but they're not really effective weapons that can be fired. They might explode or misfire. So the United States figured out their analysts, CIA experts, national security advisors, and Bush concluded that let's take our time. And sure enough, they did. And by the time they signed the big deals with the Russians, the U.S. got the best terms. The greatest number of warheads were reduced, retired to safety, safe, safely uh, dismantled and, re and put out of commission. And that's the best way to run things. That's a responsible thing. That's what a great leader does. And Bush was very awesome diplomatically. He was a master at it. He was also a very good director at the CIA. I've interviewed enough former people at CIA in my long uh, career as a journalist. My first contacts with CIA people going back to when I was just 16 years young, when I was trying to chase some UFO cases through the Freedom of Information Act and through friends of mine that I knew uh, back then named Bill Spaulding of Ground Saucer Watch. I was the youngest member of Ground Saucer Watch. In fact, I was the only member allowed to join the group who was under 18. <laughs> they made an exception in my case. I was very honored. So in trying to deal with these agencies and things like that, I can tell you that George Bush was highly regarded by them. Now, unfortunately, you have a group of young people and so-called la-la progressive liberals, left-wingers today, Democrats, Democrats, whatever you want to call them. And you know I talk about them a lot because I think I should because I think people need to be aware of what they really do and what they're up to. They need to be exposed. They will lie and say, well, the fact that Bush is a highly regarded former CIA director proves that he's part of the problem, you know, because anybody who would be highly regarded as a – wonderful CIA director must be part of the system and, you know, part of the conspiracy and part of the Illuminati and the New World Order and all that other stuff. Well, again, if you go back to the stupidity, because it's been there for decades, folks, it's not something new or unique to millennials. They didn't invent this stuff. They just ape it like other mindless types. This idea of a New World Order, Google it. In fact, Google George Bush and the New World Order. You will see the same tired headlines. I certainly remember them going back to Gulf War I when Saddam was kicked back out of uh, Kuwait and he was forced to go back to his own country, Iraq, and brutalize it, which he always did, of course. The United States forced him to go back in Gulf War I or the first Gulf War. Well, back then there was this talk about a new world order and that Bush was the leader of it and how the U.S. was going to take over all the stuff in the Middle East and all the oil and seize it. And the real reason for that war was the oil, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Then you heard the same excuse again when George Bush Jr. was president and the war with Iraq. We were supposed to get all that oil too. That's the real we reason we started it. That's the reason we were upset the Shah was overthrown by Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini. All this nonsense. Again, it wasn't true, but you heard the same tired headlines. So don't fall for it. The fact that Bush is a highly regarded former director of the CIA tells you that he was – as most people remember him, a highly regarded former CIA director. In fact, so many people assumed he was going to continue in that role. 
that when Jimmy Carter beat Gerald Ford, when Gerald Ford ran for re-election, it was almost as big of a shock back then as it was when Hillary Clinton didn't get to, you know, replace uh, Barack Obama in the White House. It was the shock at the time that Jimmy Carter came out of nowhere running a campaign promise, which people were naive to fall for, uh, that basically said, I'll never lie to you, which was a lie in itself by Carter. And, of course, Carter diplomatically was a failure and a disaster. In three months alone, you had Mecca, Medina taken over. Uh, I'm sorry, Mecca. You had a hostage situation going on for days as French commandos finally uh, stormed the area and killed militants that had seized the uh, holiest of places in the religion of Islam in Saudi Arabia. Then you had, of course, the Iranian Revolution. And then on December... Uh, Christmas Day in 1979, to cap off that year for Jimmy Carter, you had the Russians invade Afghanistan. And thanks to Jimmy Carter getting the CIA and putting clueless Stansfield Turner in there, instead of people like George Bush, the CIA was clueless. They had no idea that the Russians were going to invade Afghanistan. They just ignored the intelligence. Gee, when has that happened before in the history of the CIA? And boom, they invaded Afghanistan, and things went downhill from there. So... That, in a short version, is the type of stuff that Bush was involved in. A lot of young people don't know he was also a hero in World War II. He was a uh, part of a bomber crew. He was shot down in the Pacific. So, again, Bush was a hero from day one, from what uh, journalist Tom Brokaw had called the greatest generation or that greatest generation, people who fought in World War II. They understood international diplomacy. They understood what wars were about, what patriotism and nationalism, when it's practiced properly, are actually good things. Whereas today, young millennials think that if you're a nationalist, that's somehow bad as if you're a racist or that if you criticize somebody like Barack Obama, you must be a racist just because he's black. No, how about because he's wrong or you disagree? And it's okay for people to agree to disagree. You know, if you go back and you look at the uh, debate styles between Bill Clinton and, and George Bush, you can see there's a clear generational difference. And in how Bill Clinton handled those debates was very similar to how Jack Kennedy handled the debates against Richard Nixon. Again, there was a clear generational difference. Kennedy used the advantage of television and his youth and good looks to uh, win those debates, whereas Nixon wasn't a TV-friendly personality. Bush was a bit awkward on TV. He wasn't comfortable there. Even his son wasn't comfortable, even though both ended up occupying the White House. So when he went up against uh, the governor, then governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, of course, being a Kennedy knockoff, a Kennedy wannabe, idolized Kennedy, met him when he was a teenager in the uh, Rose Garden in the White House. There's a famous photo of them shaking hands. Of course, Clinton won that debate, and of course, the economy was the issue. Uh, Bush was not good at managing the economy. He was good at managing things internationally, whereas Clinton was better at managing the economy, but terrible at managing things internationally. And we'll come back after the commercial break and continue that and talk about that in segment three. We'll be back after this commercial. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Eli Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's author of a fascinating book, Amen. 
It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Dot com. Welcome back to the third segment here on Cal's Corner Radio Show here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf and I'm your host and the executive producer of the show is Rob McConnell. Now, we're talking about the death of President George H.W. Bush. We were also talking about how he was a highly regarded CIA director. He was CIA director for one year. He was, because of his long-standing connections with the CIA, he was a, in a perfect position to be vice president of the United States and was able to get a lot of stuff done even when he was president of the United States, such as look at the incredible number of nations he put together in a coalition to line up against former Iraqi genocidal dictator and tyrant Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War. His son finished that off in the second Gulf War, toppled Saddam Hussein, and there are mixed reactions and views over that. Let's distinguish between the act of what his son did versus what his father did, which was not to go into Iraq and destabilize it further. It had already been destabilized enough when Saddam Hussein was driven out of Kuwait. Now, I will tell you that um, I want to start this segment by getting a little bit on a soapbox here, metaphorically speaking. Now, again, I think all of us, if we were to write the names of our closest friends down, and we were to ask them and we were to say which ones like history and which ones don't. Most of the people, at least I know, and most people that I know that they know would say that they don't really care for history. Yeah, certain things in history might be interesting, whatever. But overall, they don't really care about history. They're not going to drop what they're doing to watch something on the Discovery Channel or the History Channel about it, whatever. Yeah, again, parts of history are interesting as it hits them upside the head or whatever or they hear things growing up, but overall they just don't really care about history. Fine, everybody has the right to be interested or not interested in what they want to be. I admit I can't relate to that mentality because I love history and I love everything I'm, I, I don't know <laughs> because I love learning new things constantly. I'm a why person. I love the, to know the why of the why of the why of the why, but I love history. So when I was a young boy learning history, and I learned what happened in World War II, that here we fought this war against this Nazi dictator, and we fought against Imperial Japan, and we used two atomic bombs on them, and we defeated them, and we wrote their constitution, and we're supposed to help spread democracy and freedom, and all the countries are busy copying America. Nobody's copying Saudi Arabia. Nobody's copying communist China. Everyone's trying to copy America, so we must be doing something right, despite what our critics say. So why is it that you know we <clears throat> freed Hitler or people from Hitler in Europe and then we let Stalin take them over? Okay? In other words, why did we free people from one country, from one tyrant who killed people in huge numbers by the millions, and then we give them over to another tyrant who's even killed more people? What does that say about us as a country? What does that say about us, especially the United States, who is an immigrant nation? So when we told Stalin, sure, you can have Hungary, we don't care. And there's a lot of Hungarian immigrants who are in the U.S., so obviously they were affected. Their relatives are over there. What does that say about us as a country, as a nation, as a people, as human beings? That's really ultimately what matters. Well, when I was growing up and I was a young boy and I heard this news, I remember emotionally being devastated, like, wow, we really did this. That's really effed up, you know, and of course I said the word. And I still feel that way. And I felt really bad and sad and, and disgusted and, and disgraced as an American for 
having being able to say my country did this. We didn't care. We just didn't care. We didn't care about Central Europe. We didn't care about Eastern. Let the Russians have their way. Just let them do whatever. It's not our business. And yet it was that attitude of it's not our business. Hitler's not our business. that kept us out of the war in the first place. That had we bothered to get involved and cared earlier, millions of people would still be alive. There would not have been a Holocaust. The world would have been very different. But we just didn't care. And we didn't care in World War I. We waited a couple years for that war to fight. Then it went nowhere for a couple years. So then we finally got off our butts and jumped into that. A few months later, the war ends. Then it's like, we don't care. It's your business. You sort it out. Well, then World War II starts a couple you know, later in another decade because World War I didn't really get resolved like it should have been because we didn't care. And then, of course, we didn't care because now we only care about Russia and the spread of communism. We don't really care about the countries in between. We do and we don't, but we're not consistent about it. Well, when I moved to Europe, I was happy to move into the former Iron Curtain countries in the former Czechoslovakia, which was a great place to live in Prague. It's a beautiful city. Thankfully, it wasn't destroyed in the war. It was only not destroyed in the war because the West didn't care. To appease Hitler so that they could have peace in our time, quote unquote, they just gave the country of Czechoslovakia over to the Nazis. Hitler immediately declared it no longer existed. It instead, was to become a protectorate, one called Moravia, the other called Bohemia. There was to be no more Czechoslovakia. So today the country is called the Czech Republic and it consists of about 10 million people. And you can still see in the country, it's a very beautiful country. The people there are wonderful. They're incredible. I have some incredible friends over there. Um, you can still see plenty of stuff from the decades that communism ruled it. I lived in apartments that uh, Stalin built <laughs> that he was proud of that were the epitome of socialism. And, of course, you can see the concentration camps and the stuff the Nazis did. There's even a museum there to an extinct race, the Jews, where you have a museum that Hitler was setting up there in Prague to an extinct race, the Jews, because they were expected to be wiped out by the time the war was ended. That was the plan. And there's a lot of names in there, including relatives of mine who died and were victims of Hitler's Holocaust. And today what's really sad is, although I wasn't old enough to actually experience that stuff firsthand, at least I can appreciate it as much as a person who actually ended up living over in that part of the world, being in love with history and researching it, down to the point where I even found relatives I didn't even know I had that had been survivors of some of this stuff who had the same last names all during the 10 years I was there. It was incredible exploring and pursuing this research, historical research for all these different countries. And yet when I talk to people today, the young millennials about any of this, what it's like to even go outside the U.S., they just look at you like, like you're from another planet. It's really sad because you have to explain things like who Hitler was. Yeah, they've heard the name before, but they don't really know who Hitler was from a I really understand how bad he was viewpoint. And the reason I know that is because in the same breath, they'll say Trump is Hitler. Oh, yeah, he's just like Trump. No, he's not. <laughs> not even close. In fact, for those idiots out there, and I'm sorry to use that term. I don't, you know, maybe, I, I, actually, I, I apologize for using that term. I'm insulting idiots now. For those people out there who say that Trump is Hitler or even close to him, let me give you a simple fact that completely shows that you are the person with the mental issue, not Trump. You're the one who doesn't understand common logic, basic common sense, basic decency 101. In fact, I'm not even sure your IQ is in double digits. Let me prove it. If Trump were Hitler, do you think for a moment you'd be alive to even criticize him, let alone put in writing or talk on TV the crap that you do that you pass off for news? No, you wouldn't. You might get away with one broadcast, but that would be it. Because if Trump was Hitler, you'd be dead or you'd be in a concentration camp uh, streamed live on Facebook or Fear Book or whatever you want to call it. OK, but it isn't happening. Instead, you get to bash him every night. You get to say the, the, the most ridiculous, filthy things about him because you've got the right to free press. 
but you don't have the right to lie, but you do anyway. And you lie through these exaggerated so-called comparisons, which are really comparisons, as in capital C, capital O, capital N, comparisons. They're cons. They're con jobs. They're not real. It's BS, bullschlocking, okay? That's what you do. So the moment anybody drops the N-word, the Nazi word with Trump and the Republicans, game over. They have shown that they just don't know what they're talking about. And ask them the question, well, if he's like Hitler, how can we be having this conversation? How can you have it tomorrow with anybody you want if he's Hitler? How come they're not arresting you and shutting you up and gassing you, burning you in an oven in Auschwitz? How come? In fact, where are his Nazis that guard him? I haven't seen an SS guard uniform one. In fact, his daughter's Jewish. Hmm, how many Jewish daughters did Hitler have? It goes downhill from there. So don't fall for these ridiculous arguments. They're ridiculous. They're stupid. In fact, I don't even know a word that shows how stupid they are. They're beyond stupid. You need, you need a modifier to add to the word to even come close to, to expressing how stupid it is because I honestly don't know of a single word that expresses how dumb this is. But yet, look at the headlines, look at the media, look at what millennials say. And yet, a lot of people hearing this, they don't say anything. They're not thinking, well, um, he's wrong because Hitler was whatever. This weird thing goes on where they just let the remark pass, even though they may know a bit more about Hitler than the millennial does because he or she is clueless, obviously. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saying this. But yet, you have someone who's slightly older who knows a bit better but they still don't say anything. You don't take them to task. Yet I'm from a generation where you say, whoa, stop right there. Game over. Pause. Time out. Whatever. Let's talk about this. That's not true. And we get in your face and we agree to disagree. Worst case. And fine. That's just part of life. Nobody needs their safe space. Nobody calls a lawyer. Nobody says, oh, he hurt my feelings because of whatever. We just agree to disagree. That's the way it should be. And George Bush was one of those politicians. He's not like a Barack Obama where he tried to please everybody and ended up pleasing nobody. We'll be back after this commercial break. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at SimulTV.com. Do it today. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. 
So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Welcome back to the fourth and final segment here on Cal's Corner Online Radio Show here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Once again, my name is Cal Korf and I'm your host and the executive producer of the show is Rob McConnell. So we were talking again about the death of President George H.W. Bush, how a lot of young people today – millennials don't appreciate or have any idea really unless they're really into history and most of them are not and that's not a criticism of them most people don't care for history that's their business i disagree with that but that's just me they don't appreciate not only who he was but of course they weren't alive and they don't appreciate from an experience uh standpoint what it was like when the cold war ended and how things changed after the cold war ended I feel very blessed that I lived in Europe during that special time that that part of Europe was transitioning out of communism into what it is today, part of the European Union. I'll never forget, for example, that every 90 days I had to actually go across the border and get a stamp in my passport. And what I would do is I would walk across the border from the Czech Republic into what was East Germany and I would uh, – get a stamp from the check guard I you know say a joke or two wave walk past and about 10 feet past him is the German guard then I'd get a stamp I'd speak some German with him because I do speak German and then about 100 meters up the road would be a nice little pub I'd go in there and have some schnitzel and some sauerbraten and then I would go ahead and uh, have a nice beer then I'd turn around and walk back on the other side of the road see the same German uh, he would stamp me going out. I'd say, Auf Wiedersehen, bis später, and, you know, 90 Tage später, you know, 90 days later. And then uh, I would smile to the same check guard and come back again and get the entry stamp. And I'd have to do that every 90 days. And it was a cool way to go see the different border towns and things like that. It's where I discovered, for example, that in Barnsdorf, that there are actually people who live in the mountains inside caves. It's, it's quite a trip. They actually have their homes inside the mountains there. It's actually quite elaborate up there. And you'd never know it, you know, when you look at these coal-colored mountains. You'd never know that the people actually live inside them, some of them. And so uh, when they joined the EU, that was all over. You went back – you went to the one-year visa stuff. So I didn't have to uh, go ahead and um, – go across that border every 90 days. So when I plan my travels, they had to be different. They had to be more deliberate rather than required by law. And I remember when I left the country to go to India, I walked past that border spot and I filmed it. I still have that footage from today and, of course, the original stuff and it's gone. It's just a bunch of debris and there's no sign anymore. And uh, it's like one big happy continent now, one big country, mega country. At least that's the ideal of the EU. And the EU as it exists today, let's be honest, would not be around as it is if it weren't for a president like George W. Bush. Because again, for those millennials listening to this, you were not alive and do not know the enormous cost involved in fighting the Cold War. Yes, nuclear bombs did not go off, thankfully, but people did die thousands of them. One could argue millions over time, especially if you factor in those who will never be born because they weren't free. The fact is that uh, roughly half of Europe was captive, held under communism and tyranny, didn't have freedom of speech. 
you had East Germany, you had Poland, you had uh, the former Czechoslovakia, you had Romania, you had Bulgaria, you had Hungary. You had all these other countries, including Georgia, that were part of the USSR, including countries like Kazakhstan, all of which are independent now, but that was not the case back then. And then after the world's uh, other superpower, which was Russia at the time, imploded, and it was, of course, the largest nuclear power at the time, um, you then had to control those weapons, make sure that they didn't get into the wrong hands. And then, of course, the Cold War was over, so both armies had to stand down. The militaries had to you know, essentially stop targeting each other. In fact, the nuclear weapons for the first time were no longer targeted directly at each other. They were actually removed away from being targeted against each other at that time. Again, we can thank Reagan and Bush for this. And then, of course, reducing the number of nuclear weapons and then putting that uh, material to other use. Again, we can thank uh, Bush for handling this. And then Bush unexpectedly loses uh, the re-election and Clinton beats him. And the issue is the economy. Americans are thinking about the economy. Well, it turns out that Bill Clinton was in the right place at the right time. And this is not to criticize Clinton, but let's be blunt. If Bozo the Clown had been president when Bill Clinton was elected, after the first few years of the Cold War having ended, he wouldn't have had to have been an economic genius to appear as if he was an economic genius because a lot of money, ultimately trillions of dollars, was no longer being spent on the defense related industries related to the Cold War because it wasn't going on anymore. So the economy had some extra cash and economic viability that wasn't there before. And of course, at the same time, the dot-com boom was starting to explode. But for those people, even today, who just worship the ground that the Clintons walk on and think he's an economic genius who, uh, you know, the the <laughs> – the most common claim I hear is, oh, when Bill Clinton was president, we had a surplus, you know. Yeah, well, depends on how you do the math, okay? First of all, you have to remember that uh, it was the Republicans who reined in the spending. It wasn't the Democrats. And I'm not a pro-Republican by any means, but let's be honest. They're the ones that kept some of that in check, a lot of it in check. Secondly, you have to remember that by the time Bill Clinton left office, which is what ultimately matters, folks, is what condition you leave the White House in and the country in when you leave, da hello. That's how Barack Obama got in there because Bill or George Bush left it in terrible condition economically, especially. So, of course, uh, Obama got elected. To, uh, in, he inherited a mess. So, what happened is Bill Clinton left the economy in a recession. The last recession that occurred was the dot com bubble burst. You can Google it. Remember companies like Red Hat? Well, check their stock before it burst after the dot-com bubble burst versus after. I hope you weren't a stockholder at that point and hope you sold your shares in time because the whole thing went under. <laughs> yeah, well, Bill Clinton left the country in the biggest recession at that time up to that time after the Great Recession. It has since been taught by the one that Bush left, <laughs> but the point is Clinton – you know, put his pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And he benefited especially from the fact the Cold War was over. Now, this fact, once you factor it in, kind of puts Clinton's legacy in a different perspective because, let's be blunt, I'll use a little politically correct English here, which you know I don't like to do. You have to have special talent to screw up an economy that benefits from the Cold War ending, which was the most expensive war ever fought, even more than World War II, and one combined, all the wars combined, America ever fought. The most expensive was the Cold War. You have to have very special talent to screw up an economy that benefits from that most expensive war ever fought ending, and you still and, – and the dot-com thing exploding, the internet taking off, and you still end up leaving – the world's only superpower with the recession. Wow. That 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 is the same kind of special talent that the Democrats have, and of course this was the Democrats who did it. Clinton's a Democrat, and I often call them Dumblocrats because they do dumb things. It's a scientifically accurate term when I use it. Look at this power they had when Barack Obama took power in the White House, they had a supermajority. They owned Congress the Senate, the White House. Two years later, eh, supermajority gone. 
it takes special talent to have all the marbles in your own basket and then you screw it up. And of course, they lost all their power when Trump took over. Okay? And now they've got some of it back, but it wasn't this really big blue wave. It was more like a blue splash. And of course, during the midterms, things are going to change. I mean, do the math here, folks. When you have the entire Congress, essentially 454 seats up for re-election, um, all of them, the odds are you're going to pick up at least 20, 30, 40 seats. doesn't matter if you're one of the two parties. That's in statistical probability. It would be unusual if you didn't. So if you really want to see how this blue so-called wave or splash is really deceptive, just look at the certain district in Queens that – Orcasio Cortez won. This is the young, uh, youngest uh, member of Congress. She's, I think, 29 now. She's been elected to Congress. She represents a small area that has Queens in it, and I think part of Manhattan. I may not be sure of, of that second part. It's the same area where Amazon.com is moving into, which is hysterically funny because she's a socialist, a hardcore socialist. So she hates companies like Amazon.com because they're evil, vile, capitalist countries in her mind. So guess what? Their new headquarters are coming to roost in her district, so she's going to be their representative. Boy, that's going to be a very interesting first meeting with Amazon's lobbyists <laughs> when they come into her office. Anyway, we'll see how long she lasts. Anyway, in her district, okay, there was something like 120,000 Democrats registered to vote, and she got something like 10 percent of those people voted. And yet she won 70% of the roughly 10 to 12% of the people who voted in the district. So it's not really a representative election. When the representative ends up winning by winning only 7, 70% of the 10 to 12% of the people who bothered voting, you don't have representative government at all. You have actually unrepresentative government, and that's what we have in a lot of places now in Congress in addition to its usual dysfunctional government, which, of course, is an oxymoron in itself because the government just doesn't function. That's why the country is mega politically divided now, and that's why you have people calling Trump everything from a Nazi to people thinking now that it's – you know, offensive if you don't call them, you know, if you call a baby a, a, a boy or a girl, they have to be a baby now. Let the baby decide what, what gender it wants to be. Back. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. 
Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. <laughs> 